ideas and all the things that our the architecture can do. But I want you to think that that's all of it. In fact, it's not even most of it. It's the most interesting part. And if you start <coughs> discussing that first, then the other stuff kind of comes along. But architects try to solve lots and lots and lots of small problems without really particularly thinking about the cosmologies, the problems of sociology, cosmology, science. Uh, I thought it's, one of the big ones is the uh, garage fronts. There are some solutions to the garage front problem. If you drive around uh, America, actually, suburban America is an interesting thing because it's unbelievably ugly. Uh, but you're so used to it, you don't notice it. And that's a bad thing. If you get used to, if you get used to really horrible things that so you don't notice it, they just hang around a lot. So uh, architects are always trying to figure ways to solve the problem. Now, why do we have the, the garage problem? It's really simple. If you face Street, you don't need a turnaround zone, and so you can get more houses next to one another. So basically, you got the garage facing the front so that you get the best use of the land. You put the garage facing sideways so you don't see it from the street. You need a big turnaround in your parking lot, and only rich people can do it. So you get more people in suburbia, but they're kind of ugly, so you either quilt them or you put the, what's her name, Pamela Anderson. They watch out if you know her. It's kind of funny, I did it. Whoever lives there gets to drive through her mouth every night. <laughs> 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 yeah, you know, you know. <laughs> well, not every problem is that. <laughs> but we all, we're only going to deal with the big problems. I want to just sort of review a little bit what we talked about. I managed to get the entire history and theory of 20th century architecture on one slide. <coughs> It's pretty good. Uh, can, can we get any of these lights? Can they just come off? It's a, it's a mystery which one is love. Don't push them off. That's good. They stop. No more push them. Okay, just remember on the left is the pyramid of the cube. The pyramid uh, is bigger at the bottom, and smaller at the top, meets the ground, kind of turns into the ground. So it's very much about both the uh, idea of the earth and the sky us and God, and also about the land, uh, or the ground. The cube is equal at all sides, more conceptual, tends to be uh, independent of its site, and it's, it's a particularly a difficult problem for architecture because uh, the cube, the architecture sits on the ground, so you never get to see the sixth side. So it's automatically a conceptual problem in architecture, but it's almost impossible to get the cube to be a cube. Which is why we tend to lift it off the ground in 26 And then there are these three houses, which I want you to, these three houses, I swear to God, if you just learn these three houses, you can explain almost everything there that you can see. 90% of everything you see in architecture, you can explain by referring to these three houses. This is the Corbusier, Villa Savoie, which are just these three. This is Mies van der Rohe's Farnsworth House. This is Philip Johnson's glass house. Now, I, uh, when I was teaching to you this I think a week ago, in this place I actually had um, The Falling Water by Frank Lloyd Wright. And it's the same as this. It's just, this is so clear, it's so easy, I just use it as a way of remembering it. Because Frank Lloyd Wright's house is so complex, beautiful, and you're always looking at the river and the water, it's, it's harder to remember. So these are the three you remember. And if they're all about the cube, but actually this is off the ground. Remember, so it's disestablishing the land. I mean, the ground is land. It's trying to stop the ground from being able to support <coughs> a kind of power politics. This is different. This is you. So there's no door here. Remember, where we're sitting right here, that was right uh, No door. You come up. There's a rooftop garden. This is a, actually different. You come up a staircase. It's really important. And you go in there. So this is much more like a stage set. It makes you feel like you're on stage. And architects use that effect to change your from one character to another character. As if it's a movie set. So it can set you free in a, in a certain way. Not by changing your relationship to the public, <coughs> but by, by making you feel like you're a different character. Very much like clothing does. So you dress up. I know it's most of you dress for my lectures, much like you go to a football game, which I think is pretty cool. We should sell hot dogs in here. Um, 
But if you go out on a date, you're going to dress differently. If you go, if you put on a tuxedo, you're going to you'll feel differently inside. It's quite, it's interesting how what you wear makes you feel differently inside, makes you behave differently inside. And since we're wearing architecture all the time, then the power of architecture to establish new characters or to open up ranges of characters is actually profound. And then the last one is, even though it looks like one of these cubes, it's actually a pyramid. Remember, because this is made of brick and it has that shape, because mostly it sits on the ground, or it sits right on the ground, and uh, this is made of brick, and that brick kind of reflects the ground, it's kind of earth material, and then it goes all the way up to the house. So those are the three houses. I just, and then we're going to derive those, those three projects, basically, are the way 20th century architecture has tried to think about the difference between this world and the world before us. I mean, the, this point in history and the time before that. And it has to do with either conceptual project, we either think about things differently. For example, you think about the whole world differently because of uh, Einstein. You're, you know, Einstein's theory of relativity has become a way of, or quantum mechanics uncertainty theorem, has become a way of understanding that the uh, whole, whole sorts of relationships in the world. So we understand that every uh, that cultures are relative. That we also understand that there can never be any profound uh, knowledge so much that anything can be explained all the way in the past and the future. If the time of Newton, because Newton's mechanics seemed to predict everything so perfectly, it was thought that we would be if we knew enough about where everything was and how fast it was moving, we'd be able to predict the entire future. We know that's not true. So lots of times, ideas that start in one area spread to all of, all of our uh, relationships. Conceptual architecture, and it's particularly interesting because it's about you don't have to be at the building. In fact, going to the building doesn't particularly help you understand the architecture, and it's not particularly connected to the architectural effect. The Wexford Center is an example, we'll see several examples, but we call this a conceptual project. This is a, we can call this, a, we, can call this a, we can call it here the theater project or the, or the performance project. That's the idea that architecture can change the characters, change people. Now, up until the 19th century, you basically were who you were. You were one character. You were a butler. You were a prince. You were a, a farmer. And you stayed there. So this notion of mobility of character is actually strongly associated with the 20th century. And it's particularly become a form of freedom. So that's something else architecture can try to do. This last one is slightly different. It sits on the ground. Doesn't want to, doesn't want to do this or this. It's basically trying to find new kinds of authentic relationships to, to the place that you live in. For example, you may think of an authentic, a traditional or an old-fashioned authentic relationship is a natural. <coughs> if you like natural light, go outside and have beautiful days outside. But actually, if you pay attention to your light, electric light has become a new kind of authentic. You're just as used to it. It feels real to you. You don't notice it. You can't imagine life without it. And so this idea that we would explore new authenticities is the third kind of project for examining the difference between today, when there is electricity, and 100 years ago when there wasn't electricity. It was, it's only 100 years old. It's pretty interesting. Not only that, there's lots of bad stuff about, for example, electric light. You don't notice. You take for granted. For example, uh, it always makes a sound. It's a B below middle C. It goes two octaves, not two octaves below middle C. It's a B. So if you're a composer and you're a trained musician, you can sit quietly and listen to the hum of the electricity and get that note. So you can start composing without going to the piano. But you hear it all the time and you don't notice it. Okay, so those, that's just by review. We are able to do lots of tricks now because we can see this house and we immediately recognize this has this. It's on top. This is on the bottom. And then we talked a little bit about why an architect might want to do that. This is a full house of just reviewing. Uh, it's even more interesting. This is a this is this looks like if you take the forms of the pyramid and you take the cube, you can start to do really interesting things. This is a cartoon which the architect then turns into a, these are called follies. Follies are usually garden <coughs> Works of architecture built for gardens. Uh, they're, they're oftentimes used by architects to do experiments that are even too radical for a house. Remember, we talked about the house or the guest house in particular being a very good place to do experiments. So these are built in uh, and they have a really incredible power. The name of them is this is the house of the suicide, and this is the house of the mother of the suicide. 
And you can get a, you can feel in the architectural forms something like the depression of the suicide and the horror and shock of the mother of the suicide with these very simple forms in the garden. Uh, these are, they travel around here, go inside and outside. But you can get, so either we're looking for those three houses or the basic operations of cubes and pyramids. Also, architecture has this other power. If you see this house, see this thing you saw, then you look at this, it's a construction site. This is actually a construction site on the garage up by uh, Arps. But all of a sudden, that takes on a real view. Uh, if you see that, you recognize that and they're not, it's not just something on the way to be a piece of ugly concrete parking lot, it's actually quite beautiful. And so architecture has the ability to sensitize you and awaken you to all sorts of things that are going on around you in a very different way. And hopefully you'll start paying attention to them and uh, enjoying that. Now, you're far enough along, you're advanced enough, that you should be able to make some guesses, at least identify this building. This is a building in Toronto. Uh, it's an architecture school, so it's a pretty difficult building. It's a pretty weird building. Wouldn't you count this among the weirdest building you've ever seen? So let's just see how you do. Okay. Uh, you. What's your name? Sarah. Sarah, what do you think? What do you see? What's it look like? Well, you only got five things to remember. <coughs> Three houses and a cube and a pyramid. So does it look like a pyramid? Okay. Not a pyramid. Look like a cube? Not really, except for what are the identifying features of a cube? Somebody help Sarah. What are the most important features of a cube? Six sides. Six sides, all sides equal. Right. So what do you notice on this building? It's a rectangular prism. It's a rectangular <laughs> parallel pipette or prism. Are you a math maker? No. But what makes this particularly interesting is a cube. Made of many cubes, because there's all those squares. Oh, those little squares. Yeah, those are for the windows. What makes this uh, particularly interesting is, uh, as a cube problem. Anybody else want to give this a shot? It's off the ground, but we've already seen one million. That's good. It's upside, it's kind of upside. Okay. Uh, not only can you see the bottom, but the bottom is printed exactly like the side of the all the sides. So it's making a cube even more than the other buildings that we've seen, but which you can look up and see, but the bottom is still kind of different with the reality. You don't see any windows, do you? So the square, you can see that if you look for it, the squares are there to camouflage the windows. Which also gets rid of the difference between the, the sides and the top and the bottom. The little sticks that look up that then this look like the those were the piloti. Remember the little but now you should be able to notice something really interesting. So the building is more interesting to me than it says it's not just silly, and it's not accidental. I'm sorry, it's not accidental, but this is an architecture school. Because this is a discussion about architecture for architecture. If you look really carefully, the bottom and the tops are different. They're like pencil points. So if you remember, when we were looking at this, it's one of the, so you see the bottom and you see the, you know, the, this is basically, these two buildings are basically the same. So it's not only a cube problem, this is kind of a riff on this building. But it has all sorts of different features. These are colored. This is no longer a kind of ideal white. It's like a kind of a, a like, I'm sorry, a gift, a Christmas gift, like it's wrapped up. It's very graphic. We call that. All these are colored. And the bottoms and the tops of the columns are, they're now columns again because they have a top, a middle, and a bottom. They're not piloti, even though they refer to the piloti. But they're also weird columns because they're pencil pointed at the top and the bottom. It, it has the effect of making the thing really seem like it's on tiptoes, of lightening it up. In fact, the ambition of this project is to create absolutely a weightless architecture. It looks almost like it was put on it by Photoshop or dropped by uh, the attackers in, what's it made by 
Grandma on day. Fourth of it. What's it called? Independence Day. Y'all see Independence Day? You realize that that's not a horror movie. That's a movie about architecture criticism. <laughs> that's a movie where the aliens come to Earth. They can't stand some of the buildings, so they just go around and blow them. <laughs> so, they're bad archi they're architecture. <laughs> I'm not going to explain this for you. I think it's a good exercise for you to try. Your job is only two things, in our, three things in our paper. One is uh, recognize enough details that you can start to see relationships between buildings that you know or that you study and new buildings. Then make up a story about the differences. You don't have to, you can, you can find out what the architect says, but it doesn't really matter. That's good to know, but that's not the only thing. Any story you can tell about why he would do this to this would be interesting. You know, that's an interesting thing to do. That's what I do. Sometimes there's stories about freedom. Sometimes there's stories, you know, why, why make something like a graphic cartoon? It's almost like a joke when this is one of the most famous and serious works of architecture. And then you start to pay attention to all the details. So as you make up these stories, Every little detail should be part of it. Why the windows are different, why the tops and bottoms of the columns are different, why the columns are in color, why it's graphic, why, there's a, why it does have that upside down, you know, like a pyramid upside down, that big red thing. And then the third thing, <coughs> that's all you have to do. Those, two, those are the things you have to do if you just want to have some fun with architecture. I appreciate it. If you want to do it, the third thing you have to do is make up another thing. Take the next step. You know, whenever you design a building, you're not only going to be take worrying about the function, and you're not only going to worry, be worrying about the client, you're going to be worrying about these kinds of stories and these kinds of relationships. Uh, this is how they pay for the building. They put this little <coughs> parking meter there, and everybody has to park there. Out of the <laughs> okay. Now, we ended uh, last week on this slide. As we start to take now, this is a, a house by Peter Eisman. He did the uh, Western Center. He was, gave a lecture here, I guess, uh, last Friday, which I should have mentioned. Before. This is a completely conceptual house. This is a house that's got nothing. You can go visit it. I mean, if you remember correctly, I showed you that it's strongly related to the cube. Uh, it's completely indifferent to its context. It's not about particularly views. It's not about particularly where you put the garage or all that sort of stuff. It's about these drawings. And it's about a process of decomposing the cube through a set of intellectual operations into this house. Um, it's an interesting house. And so going there and living in it is possible, and someone does. But knowing what it does in architecture is strictly understanding this operation. And so it has several features. It becomes highly intellectual, and therefore it takes advantage of the abstraction of the cube and the form of the cube to kind of radical limit. Really about thinking about things. It's basically the idea is one good way to set you someone free is to teach them to think about who they are, what they are, what their relationship to the world is. Then this is a, his student. This is Greg. Now this house uh, doesn't look as serious. It looks kind of silly. It doesn't look like you're supposed to understand it intellectually. It's sort of look like judo, drigo. Called blob architecture. Yet the projects are really similar, and, and the differences become really important. I'm gonna, there's a lot in this lecture about Greg Lynn. He's a really interesting guy. He's a fine guy. Uh, there's a, hold up his new book. On November, which you can buy for a ridiculous amount of money. <laughs> On November, and if you buy it, you can uh, turn in your receipt in and get an A. <laughs> Just tell me how many you bought, I can get my commission. On November 12th, I think it is Wednesday night, he'll be lecturing here. I hope you will come <coughs> to hear at least that one lecture. There, we have lots of lectures, they're all kind of interesting. And, but if you came to hear that, you'll, it's a slightly different level of discussion, but he's one of the most interesting lecturers and does some of the most interesting work. Here. So you'll be seeing a lot of his work today. Now this project, the problem with the cube is this. First of all, it's intellectual. I mean, it's not a problem, but in other words, it only has one mood. Eisenman's conceptual architecture. And we live in a world where mood is really important. In fact, most of the election that we've been experiencing 
It's not really about the ideas of the candidates. It's about the mood they're able to get us in, whether we're afraid of McCain or afraid of Obama, whether we like the way he looks, he's calm or not, expressing those things. So mood has a profound effect on the world. And this architecture up till now seemed only able to produce one mood, the mood of kind of reading philosophy, sort of mood. And, uh, and he uses a lot of philosophy in the work. And the cube is also associated with that because of its uh, kind of intellectual abstraction. But the other thing that's really important is you can't really understand this work unless you understand its relationship to that. So this is all these shifts and changes require that you already know the cube as an ideal condition to understand what the changes are about. Now, in the end, that turns out to be politically difficult in the sense that if you're interested in freedom or you're interested in democracy, you're going to be interested in the differences between among all of us, but you're not going to be interested in one ideal human being against which all those differences are, are measured against. That, that's not how we relate to each other. If you stand up here, anybody's welcome to do it, or you know what I'm talking about, you see, I can look around this room, and I see I don't know, 150 different places, and they're all different. I see them immediately as different. But what I don't need to do is have one ideal face that I say, this is different because it's greener, or this is different because his nose is bigger. You know, I don't do that. I don't measure it against an ideality. I just recognize each face uh, for its own qualities. And that's a completely different model for the relationship between the individual and the collective than this thing is, which is. This is the ideal thing. Sorry. And that is uh, the man we, we, we understand that because we understand that. This is a different thing. This is about setting a different mood, but also it's really about a different project completely. And then in order to understand that project, we have to understand a little bit about the relationship to geometry. So besides the pyramid and the um, uh, cube, let me remind you about the scene we saw in the movie where the, in the science fiction movie where he talks about the fact that we can maybe guess something about the way the trail look by looking at the store. Well, that turns out to be an old problem in architecture. Uh, I'm missing the slide here. Oh, look at that. There's the Vitruvian Man slide. We're supposed to go here. Everybody kind of knows Leonardo da Vinci that draws a human being inside a circle and inside a square. And that turns out that notion that use of geometry is so profound that you can find it all over the world. So these are inscriptions of man inside of uh, geometries from India and from China. Or India and another part of India. <laughs> Your homework is to find out where they're from. And you can see that's a very different idea because this, this man is in a diagonal. It's called a squatting dwarf. And his belly is in the middle represent nourishment, and it's full of cosmology. So the idea that architecture would relate to geometry is something that's really affected our, that's why you're able to see the scene, or he makes the scene, because we keep drawing us inside of geometry, because that architect, we build architecture out of geometry, because geometry is used to help make it stand up. But we think about our relationship to it, because once we build it, we live it. And not only that, geometry is crucial to not only thinking about the relationship between man and the building, but also <coughs> because we discovered that the heavens work like geometry. You know, first we got the, heaven, the planets Earth, orbited Earth in a circle, then we started to think about the ellipses, and it turned out that Kepler started shifting his attention from circles to ellipses about 25 years after <coughs> architects started building churches based on ellipses instead of circles. The Baroque architecture, famous Baroque architecture, the architecture based on ellipsoidal relationships, and that was going on about for 25 years, and then Kepler started looking at the heavens, not as if the circle was the thing, was the signature of God, but the ellipse, and he discovered it to be a more effective tool for predicting the path of the planets. And so geometry has an incredible power to connect us to very mundane things, like what stands up and what doesn't stand up, who we are, how we relate to each other, what our proportions are. And all the way up to and including very profound things like what what's the universe and God's in it. Now, there's no there's very little geometry here. What this is is a problem in topology. Now topology is an area of mathematics that grows out of geometry. And it's famous to you if, if, if you know anything about it at all, it's famous because you'll hear something like in topology you can turn 
a donut into a coffee cup. You ever heard that before? And just imagine this. Topology is the kind of mathematics that if I put my finger through the donut and I pull that hole up and then I kind of push a dent down in the donut, it becomes a coffee cup. Everybody, can you imagine that? Because the only thing that's important in topology is that if anything with one hole is equal to anything else with one hole, you are equal to a coffee cup because actually you only have one hole that goes all the way through you. Uh, and you can figure that one out yourself. And that's the only hole you got. You got lots of dents. You got that 20 dents. Your nose is a dent, your ears a dent. You're full of dents, but you got one big hole. So from a topological point of view, you can change a donut to a coffee cup into a human being. In other words, there is no ideal condition. There's no sphere that, or a donut that's the first thing and then everything else with the first hit. It's just a way of relating all sorts of things that have a basic similarity to them without there being one thing that's referred to. And that's what the topological model is used for in architecture. So the embryological house is not just this one house, but it's actually thousands of houses. These are six of them, but there literally is a way of building thousands of houses all different, everyone with a different shape, everyone with a different decorative scheme, all based out of the same kit of parts, because that's a more profound way of producing difference than changing an ideality or deforming an ideality. So the embryological house was a conceptual project, but it had an interesting pro property, and that was you didn't understand the conceptual project. You didn't understand, when you come up to it, it's just a nice house. It doesn't make you, you know what? So instead of understanding, you see Peter Eisen's house, you think, oh, oh damn, I need to know something. Like, when you say a house like that, what that looks like? Oh damn, I need to know something. Why else would it look so? This one is, you can say, I like that, or I don't like that, but you don't feel like you need to know anything. You just think, wow, that's weird. That's like one of those stupid upside down houses or a house with a shoe or something like that. So he's trying to detach the conceptual project where you have to understand that there's thousands of houses like this from the experiential project. Now that turns out to be an old problem. Uh, that, uh, in art and architecture, we study a lot of art. We look at art a lot because uh, we have a strong relationship to the arts. We also have a strong relationship to the sciences. This project, this is a painting by Jackson Pollock. Anybody know Jackson Pollock? You know, if you nod, I'm going to see you. So, who was Jackson Pollock? He was a And what, what was famous about that? I think he was very abstract. Like, people were having to do that kind of thing, but just the water Right. He just threw the paint at the canvas. And that's a painting. Now, why is that any good? Huh? He made a thousand, he made three thousand of them. What did he need by the time he was finished? Um, you kind of wonder, like, if, if you make one, why, why make another one? Because if you throw paint in the canvas three thousand times, you're going to get three thousand different paints. So it's already a project about the way individuation occurs from a process. It's not about referring to an ideal condition. But it's also important. Because instead of having to be able to, instead of having a lot of talent, having to be able to draw beautiful faces, knowing all sorts of history of art, painting, and then you know making great paintings, all he did was it was enough for him to just be there and throw the paint. So it celebrated that the value of each individual just for whatever you do, whatever action you take is good enough. Action is enough. If you are what you do, and according to this kind of art, that's good enough. You don't need to be smart, you don't need to be American, you don't need to be a college educated person, you don't need to be anything. You can, whatever you are, it's worthwhile. And that's what the philosophy behind this kind of art was. And it was really important, so important that this produced a theory of art called the mark. Okay. The mark was enough. And that was sort of the height of painting at one time. This, this painting is from 1950. And a guy named Rauschenberg came along. Andy Warhol and Rauschenberg, Rauschenberg is a little older than Andy Warhol, but Andy Warhol taught Rauschenberg how to do some of these things that Rauschenberg And Rauschenberg made these two, these are two paintings. 
called Factum One and Factum Two. And these are incredibly interesting paintings because it looks like he threw paint right to the there's a that looks like Jackson College, right? Throw paint and grips. And throw paint and grips. And then he glues on a little collage there. Then he makes another painting that's exactly the same. So this is throws paint and grips. So this idea that every mark is going to be uniquely able to identify an individual and that the mark was enough starts to be criticized by this painting. So this painting is saying, look, so you can see if you compare them, they're not exactly the same, but they're close enough that the two together criticizes the idea, the existential idea of the value of action by itself. It turns everything into a kind of product or a sign. So he, he makes a product, like you can go buy one of these off the shelf. Product out of the drip. And so that becomes a very interesting new way to think about our relationships with each other. We're not just existential individuals that thrive on our acts and ourselves, but we're also produced in the world, and we're uh, evidence of the way we're produced. And this is another uh, works, you know, works of art are very much like works of architecture, they refer to one another. It's always fun to know, though. This is a work of art called Two Pieces of Paper and Then They Will Clean Crumble. Uh, now, you don't have to know fact and one and fact and two to enjoy this. It's just funny to see two pieces of paper exactly crumble. Can anybody figure out how you do this? See? Yeah, I want to do that as a, just so you understand. Uh, I looked at this, when I saw this in the, in the gallery, I thought, oh my god, he sat there and did <laughs> <laughs> That's just the hardest thing I could ever imagine. And uh, I was on an airplane like four weeks later. And you know, they give you these napkins when you're free and you said, you know, you get like three napkins. And I, I crumpled them up and I dropped them and they were And I thought, oh shit, what are you done? <laughs> you guys actually figured it out in like eight seconds. Okay, so, yeah. hey, you know, if you could, you're much better suited for this job than I am because it's much easier than I'm trying to make it up. You don't know anything. So, anyways, kind of fun. Then you, so that set, this kind of stuff sets into motion the idea that you're going to want something to be, seem like it's radically individual, but also be reproducible in an interesting way. And this is a sculpture by Roxy Payne. And it looks a lot like, looks a lot like that house I showed you by Graham Payne. Uh, it kind of, you know, I'm going to say that. Okay, now see, I think it's really interesting. Some of you are saying yes, some of you are saying no. Some of you are saying, I wonder what it tastes like. <laughs> this is my living room. That's a painting in the back. That's a sculpture on my room. That dining room table is by the Corbusier. Remember, this is the only field you only need to know one name. That's it. Everything I'll show you is by the Corbusier. And this is my dog. <laughs> and in order to get that laugh, which lasted about 30 seconds. It took me about six hours to get the damn dog to lick the thing. <laughs> we ignored it, so I finally ended up putting a peanut butter on it. And then you can see peanut butter all over the shot, and then he got sick, so I had to wait a few more hours. <laughs> salad oil on it, and now you can see it. Anything for, you know, anything for Jim. But this is how they're produced. Uh, this is the Skumac making machine. So when he has an art show, he doesn't actually design those things. He builds this computerized painting machine, and he it makes those things, but the computer slightly changes the temperature and the flow rate. So everyone comes out the same, and everyone comes out different in the same way. So it's exactly like these other projects. You see this over and over and over again. Artists are trying to produce large numbers of things that belong to the same family, like we all belong to the same family. But th there are different in a way that we immediately recognize their differences. And it's much closer to thinking about our relationship to the world than using a kind of ideal geometry. You can see this in, I'm going to show you one more example. This is a painter from uh, Holland. His name is Philip Ackerman. And all he does is paint self-portraits. He just paints <laughs> thousands of self-portraits. He makes everyone slightly different. And I have, there are now 2,088 self-portraits over everyone different, spanning years. And it's the same kind of project. Yeah. This project, unlike it, it's 
the fact that he's a Dutch painter, like, look, you don't have to, again, you don't have to know anything. There's fun to see that. It's kind of, if you see this, you don't need to see this. But once you know about it, it's kind of interesting. And if you know a little bit more, it gets more interesting because there are two really great painters from Holland who are very famous for their self-portraits, Rembrandt and Van Gogh, or Van Gogh. Uh, and both of those are painters that are famous for using painting, it appears to say, to give a psychological insight into themselves. So they painted themselves, Rembrandt painted himself, or drew himself 80 times from a young man to an old man, and you can watch him age, and you can watch him become more serious and carry the weight of the world, and also wiser, you can see in his eyes. And Van Gogh was, had suffered very difficult uh, psychological problems, and you can see his pain. What was interesting about these paintings is that you don't really get any insight into the character. This is exactly the opposite. These are paintings about the fact that paintings lie as much as they tell the truth. Or you can make them tell any story you want them to tell. You don't, you don't have to be tied to the truth. The real interesting thing is not really the truth, but the stories that you tell, including stories about the truth. Now, just, this is a teapot by Greg Lynn. It's exactly the same as a house. It's a little bit easier to show this. But but basically, you make a bunch of them. You have to figure out how you design it so that the same number of parts, in other words, you can't just make each one separately. You have to use a computerized method, very much like we saw with the school map. And then everyone is a little bit different. But when you see it, it looks just, it looks fine by itself. You don't feel compelled to think about it. It doesn't put an intellectual burden on you. Other kinds of things are other ways to figure out how to produce these, how to detach modern architecture from its intellectual or its ambition to make a better world ideally. This is, as you can tell, this is the Mies van der Rohe. Uh, this is a house by Jesse Reiser and Nanako Nomoto. But it's, if you can see, it's, the model is made the same as the, as the land. And there seems to be some force that's bent this thing, but you don't know what the force is. Okay? So this is just a house about sort of telling a story about forces bending modernism. In other words, instead of being ideal and perfect, it gets kind of bent by the world and changes. So this is a thing, it's just telling a fictional story instead of trying to figure out the right story to tell. And architectures have become more and more and more interested in the capacity to produce large numbers of fictions than figure out one correct story to tell. Uh, it's also kind of a, there's a kind of cartoon element that's entering architectural thinking now. Uh, this is a sculpture by my good friend. Coons. Jeff Coons. Jeff Coons. I can't remember his name because this is the same as my name. And how could there be more than one Jeff in the world? There are no Alex. <laughs> uh, this is, uh, cartoons are interesting. Uh, this is Superman. Uh, if you look carefully, this is a Superman, and this is the Bizarro world. And in the Bizarro world, everything is backwards, and everything is wrong. So he had a home run, so they called him out. And he doesn't know what to do. He put two years of square, cubic, baseball. It's a little bit like, these are normal people, and these are our <laughs> They always want to do things <laughs> the wrong way. But that's actually not the card I was interested in this kind of cartoon. This is a painting by David Sally. And it's really interesting to look at because it's, it's actually, it looks like two paintings. But actually, if you look very carefully, it's the same. This is one person in bed, or she's in bed. There's the pillow, and it continues over there. So the, the scene in the background is one big scene. This line divides it as a graphic device, so it makes it seem like two different scenes. And then there's a cartoon of these people on top of it. And so all of a sudden there seems to be not one reality and then a representation of the reality of the cartoon, but two or three realities. So the cartoon world has its own reality that occupies the same space as the real world represented underneath. And we call that multiple ontologies. We call that multiple ontologies for the same reason I tell you every time I use a weird word or something, and that is, it's, you can charge money for it. You can charge, if I write down something as complicated as multiple ontologies, people will pay me and think, oh, wow, that must be really good. Multiple ontologies. So, uh, but that's a way of producing a new kind
kind of freedom in the world that we're exploring. Instead of figuring out the right architecture for the right place, matching the local context, or, or making the building exactly right to be a school, or exactly right to you know, in other words, trying to, instead of trying to figure out, kind of figure out what the ideal building will be at any point in time, and in any situation, trying to figure out how to produce architecture which has the character of making this kind of world, where many different realities can occupy at the same time. And that way, you're producing more existential territory, more ways for people to feel at home in the world that they live in. So instead of, like if you go to uh, Bexley or Upper Arlington, most of you may like those houses, but I can't stand those houses, personally. And I just, I wonder, why do I have to feel trapped there? Why isn't there some place where I can feel it? Or I can't, I can't stand uh, is that like New Alden. Have you ever been out to? Have you ever gone up to the Wexner's house? It's really a very funny house. Uh, the Wexner's house is based on the Wexner's house is a lot like Washington D.C. It's based on the architecture of this thing that's this big, but he wanted it this big. So the architect, you know, we know how to make a house look right when it's this big, but to make this architecture this big, basically you have to make everything gigantic. So the, the door is gigantic, the lamps are gigantic, it's completely, it's unbelievably fun. In other words, you couldn't figure out how to make a big house by itself. It took a, a smaller type of house. And when you walk in it, you kind of feel like you're in a Disney park. It's, it's really, and I, I'll say this to Les the other day. This is an uh, example of an uh, architect. This is the same guy that put the filter uh, garage on. This is a Hagen Island housing project. If you notice, um, it looks like they're not the things. <laughs> yes, they're different colors for different people. And every house looks like a toy house. And it's kind of a way of changing the world from a world about you know, the right people for the right you know. One of my favorite quotes, and I love this guy, I swear to God, but uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know Arnold Schwarzenegger, governor of California, he was when he was running for governor, he said, California for Californians. They were sort of against illegal immigration. But I thought it was really funny since he's from Vienna. <laughs> but anyway, California for Californians is a, is a kind of political idea of who belongs someplace, who doesn't belong someplace. And architects are very much tied to that situation of what kind of architecture belongs in what kind of place. And this is, starts to loosen that up a little bit. You can start to make all sorts of places, and I guess uh, turn down the volume on who belongs and who doesn't. This is just for the, this is a student project that we did here. We did here in the studio, and it's combining some of the ideas of the blob architecture that we saw earlier with toys and uh, cartoons. So this is a house. You know, it's got. If you look at it. It looks a little bit like the cartoon, like the Simpsons clouds. It's the kind of stuff we do in the studio. Uh, the problem with this house is basically you have to make a million of them for it to be to work. So the real, the real issue now in the cartoon work that we're looking at and some of the other work is that how do you make one? And so this is a new house by Greg Lynn. This is the house where he himself and his wife. And of course you'll notice right away yeah, it's, 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 look, if you remember the Villa Savoie, it's, it's the Nice on the top, it's Villa Savoie on the bottom. Yes, you can make a little blah. This is, belongs to that whole argument. see this problem of multiple ontologies in this world. I just want to show you something that these are weird windows. Uh, there's a kind of funny thing going on about this is art. I'm sort of lost in my slides right now, so <laughs> this, uh, this is art from long time ago. This is a serious art. This is kind of art from 10 years ago. This is playing art. And that is a fat art. So I just think, 
people like me being told we're fat. <coughs> Artists were just making a bunch of art. This was skinny modern art. Everybody was healthy. This was sort of okay you know, art. Now we're being told it's okay to be fat. I don't like that. This is now, so I'm now at the right. <coughs> Thank you. 
you to do it? Or did your teacher do it for you? Your dad do it for you? <laughs> he said, Dad, can you help me with my homework? <laughs> it's very smart. It's a very, I mean, it's a really beautiful idea in many ways. I think it's the, I think it's my favorite one. I mean, it's the most sophisticated one for lots of reasons. It starts with a corner window. It's already a big deal. Uh, because it understands that uh, the corner is an interesting place in, a, in a, any building. It's uh, interesting because it goes to two views, because uh, it's a difficult thing to join. I mean, it's very smart. It then expands them out until it becomes a volume. That in itself would have been enough. But then it, it then shades it, I think, or sandblasts it, so that it becomes translucent. And then cuts these little, or, lines out these little slots in it so you get various slots in the view plus it's drawn in this is really great. You really frankly you could graduate. <laughs> it's really good. Uh, so that's I'd say that's the they're all good. I mean it's not about this, this is the best in a certain way of you know, looking like most like the teaching, but they're all pretty you know I want to show you. this is probably the where are you supposed to go to the Warhol show? Wasn't there something about the Warhol show? I can't remember. Were they supposed to go? Yeah. yeah. This is the only one that had anything about Warhol that was obvious to me. That, and I thought it was really uh, unbelievably current. Whose is this? Really? Yeah. Well, it's <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I swear to God, it's not what I imagined at all. I thought. Wilder life, don't you? Yeah. You're kind of imagining a wilder life. You're at college, you go to the world. <laughs> this, 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 the thing I think is fantastic about this window is it's got a title. Uh, this, this, is the, this is the playing dead window. <laughs> and it looks like the Greg Lynn stuff I've been showing you. It looks like the blah blah. In other words, it has a lot of ways that it's. Kind of feeling what's going on in an interesting way. I think my idea was she went to see the Andy Warhol electric chair. She has all sorts of uh, adolescent depression things about how life sucks. And <laughs> <laughs> I can't agree. This is a my life sucks and then it's going to get worse. <laughs> I'm going to end up in an electric chair. <laughs> but I'm just going to play dead you know, because I'll make a little toy out of it. And then you look through the window, and this is, and remember that, and you see out, and you see everything in that kind of colors. Is that how it works? And there's one on the bottom floor, one on the top floor. And if, if it's built correctly, you can go, you can get down faster. <laughs> <laughs> really very creative piece. Your name is Britta. Yeah. Hey guys, I want everybody to take Britta to the most, the wildest parties. <laughs> <laughs> different than Greg's. This is a house for his wife. There's her bed. There's the bed. I mean, if I can show you the drawings on the other side. There's the bathroom. Little hand mirror. So it's just like yours. The only thing Greg does is he never has to work out how to build it. That's what these drawings are about. You can't just figure out what it's going to do. The problem with how you produce it, so that the stuff you can buy and how you build it becomes really the fun. And this is like 90% of the time you're going to be working on that. Once you get the ideas and how there are ideas, and once you jump through all the hoops that you have to jump through in every picture, you have to learn a whole bunch of boring stuff. You have four years of boring stuff, and you get to do This is what you're figuring out how to do. It's a lot of fun. So I thought the window exercises was great. I'm really looking forward to the movie exercises. Uh, I know I didn't I tell you a plan on 